Lord, I thank you for the abundance of your grace. Lord, I thank you for everything that you mean to us. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your presence. For in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your son. Father, I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the gift that you gave us in our relationship with him. Holy Spirit, Spirit of grace and Spirit of truth. Spirit of grace and Spirit of truth. The very essence and heart of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. I ask you to touch us. I ask you to awaken the love of our Heavenly Father in us. Lord, as we gather in this room this morning, I thank you for your presence. Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with me, if your presence doesn't go with us, we're not leaving, we're not going anywhere. I thank you for your presence. And I ask you, Lord, let your Holy Spirit, let your presence lead us this morning, let your presence lead us this day. Thank you for the gentle reminders that you give us throughout the day, even when we're not listening. You continually remind us of who we are and who we are in you. When so many struggle with their identity, just as we do. Father, this nation is struggling for its identity. The people of this land are so divided. Man is at war with man. Parties are at war with parties because we are at war with you. Lord, would you bring this nation back to its true identity? Awaken your heart in this nation. Lord, awaken your heart in, it, in its leaders. God, I pray that you bring us to so many holy moments that we would see your hand move on this nation, that we would see your hand move on its people, on its economy, that dreams would be awakened. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, you are the leader of this nation. Lord, would you download your heart through every circumstance to those who lead this nation. Father, 
I pray that your peace and your presence would fill every place where people gather to vote. Father, silence the voices of evil. Silence the voices of wickedness. Silence the voices of violence. Lord, bring us to our knees. We may encounter your holiness, your heart. I ask you to awaken, awaken in us our true identity as a people. I ask you to awaken in us, in this room, in those that are watching, in those that are listening, awaken in us our true identity, Lord, in you. Holy Spirit, would you dismantle, would you dismantle every identity we have that is apart from the identity of who we are in Christ? Give us new eyes to see with. Give us new ears to hear. Give us a heart that is able to contain the truth. Lord, I pray that your word will come alive in us. I pray for such conviction. I pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot convict. But it is your Spirit, Lord. It is your Holy Spirit that convicts. And you convict to cleanse. You convict for life and not death. God, I ask you to give the church, your church, your bride, its identity. Lord, we are so tired of chasing identities, our identities in things or in accomplishments or in relationships or in possessions. Lord, we've given our hearts to a counterfeit. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us for not seeing who we are in you. More than just words being said. I ask you for a revelation. God, I ask you for such deep surgery within each of our hearts today that you God would go so deep and that you would dismantle and cut and remove every cancer and every lie that we've been feeding on Lord our lives belong to you we've always been yours you chose us before the foundations of this world. You knew our name. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for the precious people here at TGP and for the precious people that are a part of our church family, a part of your family. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that this morning, Lord, that they will receive a divine revelation from you, not from me, but from you, not from the words I speak, but the words that you speak to their hearts. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, God. We worship you. We worship you. 
ask you to do such a deep healing in us. We are accepted in you. We are loved in you. We are healed in you. We are embraced. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Would you just stand to your feet for a moment, please, and just lift your hands to him. Just begin to thank him. Begin to thank him for his grace over your life. I pray for your grace to be poured down on us. I pray for your grace to be poured out on every single person who hears my voice. Like rain, let your voice thunder in our hearts today. God, we love you. We are nothing without you. No matter what kind of day we've had, no matter what kind of week we've had, you are our bread, you're our water, you're my hunger, you're my thirst. No matter how they judge, no matter how they speak, you and you alone are the source of life. You and you alone are the source of healing and hope that you would give us a hope and a future. Lord, may we find our true identity in you. We believe so many lies, so many lies. So, Lord, today we give you our hearts. We give you everything that we've been carrying throughout our lifetime. Every identity that we've labeled ourselves or others have labeled us. I ask you to strip us clean. Take our lives back to the drawing board. And begin to write and begin to draw. Remove the pencils in everyone's hands who've been writing and who've been drawing upon our lives to be. You are the artist. You are the master artist of our creation. So Lord, we come to the altar this morning, Lord, we bring ourselves to this altar this morning, Lord, and we lay upon that altar and say, Lord, we give you our hearts. We give you our lives. And we surrender everything that we are and everything that we think we are apart from your truth. We thank you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you for your grace.
Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you. What a beautiful atmosphere of your presence in this room. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. I thank you, Jesus. We've had a, a very powerful early part of, of the, the service this morning before we came online. We just spent time in prayer and just, you know, when we just went live. God's hand will always remain on this nation because God's hand is on us. That no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're battling, I pray that today you will be awakened to the voice of God in your life, to the hand of God upon your life and your true identity in him. No matter how long we've been saved, no longer how, no matter how long we've walked with God, we struggle with identity. We struggle with who we are. We believe lies about ourselves, whether we tell ourselves these lies or others speak to us or try to shape us and form us. But I pray today that God will undo those lies in your life. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I ask you to seal our hearts, God. I ask you to seal your word upon our hearts. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your precious grace, God. Thank you for your precious grace and for the way you love us when we feel so unlovable. I thank you. I thank you. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen and Amen. I'm going to ask you if in this room, just greet one another, if you will, and just, yeah, just take your time. Just, yeah, get up. And I know we've been standing up, sitting down. And good morning. Good morning to all of you. Thank you guys so much for being a part of today. And I, I really do pray that um, the Lord will touch your heart today. If you have your Bibles, please just get them. I hope you get a notepad. And as God just speaks to your heart over the next few minutes, I, I really pray that he will touch your heart. It's amazing the things that we go through in life and the struggles that we face and the battles and everything else. And, and you just wonder why. Why do I have to go through this? I have um, I've just, I, I, I've just been in, in a real time of, of searching and digging so deep into my own life, into my own heart. Um, to just to find who I am, who I truly am in Christ. And I, um, you know, at 61, I'm still on the, I'm still on the search, and I'm still on that journey, as I know that all of us are. And so, anyways, I, I pray that, I pray that God will speak to your heart today. And um, beautiful things come when we spend time with Him and time in His presence. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's so good to see you guys. It's so good to see you guys. Um, I, I want to just, uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not usually at a loss for words, but sometimes I just get to this place where it's like, I'm at a loss for words. It's age. What's that? It's age. It's age. Yes. It, cheers, Mike. Um, yeah, it's age. I think on the natural, yeah, it's age. Then there's times where it's God doing such a deep work in us. So 
and probably because of age, because we're closer to dying than, <laughs> so anyways, I, um, I started this series on, I, our, on identity, um, and that, it all really stemmed from that Friday night that I shared with you guys a few weeks ago, and uh, where, when I was in, at a conference with David Hudson in Raleigh, and you know, these four prophets begin to pray over my life, and speak so directly, so directly into very specific things that they, they in no way could have known, in no way. Um, and I, I sat and every time I, I listened to that word, I struggle with the person that they're saying I am. Because I, I see where I am, I, I struggle with where I'm at, and then I see what they're saying and I'm like, there's a huge gulf between, you know, how I feel right now and all the things that are surrounding me. But then they're talking about this guy that God is going to do this and do that and he's done this and done that. And I'm like, I cannot connect these two men. And, and as I started asking the Lord, Chris, would you just turn the music down just a little bit, please? Um... Thank you. So I started this series last week on identity. And, and I, honestly, I think our nation right now is struggling for its identity. And so many voices, so many voices. And I'm like, can, can we just, God, would you just reveal who we are as a people, as a nation? And... And so this whole series, I, I want to really focus on, I, you know, here's what I'm not interested, I, I'm just, bear with me. I'm not interested in preaching another message. I have taught over the years, 38 plus years, and I've ministry and I've been around and I've met great people and not so great people and been, I preached at large conferences and small conferences and just and here I am at, here I am today at 61 and I'm saying who am I who am I in this season of my life who am I when I actually began this journey two years ago yeah about two years ago and it's just been this peeling back of layer after layer and so I don't I don't want to stand up here and be a talking head and give you scripture and you know you 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 go wow that's a great verse but then we don't live it out can I ask just honestly and openly how many of you still struggle at times with who you are can I see your hands that literally is all of us in this room and that's why I think this is so important and and I, and I think you're right Mike I, I do I think age and as we get older like, I don't want to repeat. I don't want to struggle with the same. I don't want to. And when I say repeat and struggle, I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about identity. I'm talking about things that we go through, we feel, we struggle with, whether it's like rejection or misunderstanding or communication or anger. And all these things are major battles that we have internally that we just often don't talk about. And so when I started this series last week on, you know, the four things that you need to know about you and, and, and why that is so important, because unless we address those things and we don't know who we are, and if you don't know who you are, you won't know how to live. And now you add scripture to that and you go, I've read these verses I've read them time and time and time again. Why didn't they impact me back then like they do now? Well, that's because I think for me, I'm in a different season of my life. And I find myself, this is hard to say. I used to trust everyone. No, I don't. 
I used to live to please everyone and found tried to find my identity in that pleasing everyone and now I don't and that is sometimes hard to reconcile who have I become are these walls that that have been put up either I put them up or God are you placing these walls in front of me so that I can guard my heart and not so easily give myself and only to be hurt or wounded or to struggle with these aspects of life, whether it's acceptance or rejection or isolation or all the things that, that I may myself, I may put myself in, but it's, I'm not allowing God to rip away those layers. So you live and you live and you live and you learn and so I, I, I approach this whole thought way different. And when I say to you before God, I, am, I have not even looked at any, I just did a series a few years ago on who am I? I haven't even looked at those notes. So everything that I'm sharing with you today is literally from the moment of my life right now. And, not, and it's not, but my life isn't important. It's, it's what God is saying in his word concerning our life. Because it's amazing because a, a lot of times we think we go through this alone, right? We go through this alone and nobody's struggling with their identity or, and everybody that you know we're around seems to be on their game and everybody's doing really, really good. And then we go, what's wrong with me? Why am I not experiencing the blessings or the favor or that kind of relationship or that kind of love or that kind of except what's wrong with me that why is God why has God like wh what is wrong with me that I am not seeing what I'm seeing in others why is that not happening for me and so a part of today's message I titled it misplaced identity and how many identity replacements we have, we have, we believed. And the truth is, you will never get your identity from horizontal life. That's the problem. We've been trying to find who we are or get our identity in this and i'll address four things in this horizontal kind of life because if you and i do not get our identity our identity from a vertical relationship we are done and we will struggle with who we are until the day we die because then our identity is is placed on us by our achievements or our relationships or our possessions. Even sometimes we try to get our identity. When I say spiritual things, I'm not talking about God's word. I'm talking about religion. So, I want to just sort of walk through this, not as a message to preach, but a story to tell that I think relates to all of us. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, please. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I want to read verses 4 and 5. And, and these are not, you're going to see you're going to see, I pray that you'll see. Because new identity will bring new potential. And the, the problem with that is this. You and I are always assigning ourselves some kind of identity throughout our life. And, you're, and, and so then you're always living out. You're always living out of that identity. Literally our entire life, 
we are we're on this on this search for this identity and 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 so we we end up assigning ourselves this identity and then for a season of our life we we're living out of that identity until that season changes and then it's like your world comes crashing down listen to these words in first peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 he says as you come to him this is the english standard version he says as you come to him would you would you just say that with me as you come to him he says as you come to him a living stone rejected by men but in the sight of god chosen and precious you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, now that is so rich. And that, that if, if we want to just, I'm going to address this in just a moment, but uh, because I'm going to come in and out of that verse. So he begins by saying, as you come to him, Peter's view is that we are committed to this ongoing fellowship and ongoing communion with our Lord. It's not just that he comes to us by grace. It's that we're, we're pursuing the one who is pursuing us as you come to him. Why is that so important? Because as you come to him, he says... A living, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God. Not in the sight of man. Not in the sight of your job. Not in the sight of your career. Not in the sight, listen, not in the sight of your marriage. Not in the sight of your family. Not in the sight of, of all the things that you think are a part of your identity. He says no. But in the sight of God, chosen and precious you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up. So here is, here, is, here is who you are. And he said, you as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a temple. And then he says, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So it's, it's, it's not that it's just by grace that he comes to me, but no, it's by grace that I now pursue the one who's pursuing me. That's the picture. I shared this. Uh, I, I, I posted about it just as encouragement. But, but the hardest thing that I ever dealt with as a young man, that started as a young man, and I've actually been dealing with, to be honest, I've been dealing with it all along. And that was the hardest thing that I ever faced in my young life is when I was in high school. And... In my, it's the hardest thing in my young life was when I was in a car accident in 1978 that nearly took my life. And I've shared a little bit about that story, but it was tragic. It, wasn't, it was tragic in the sense that there was four of us in a small, what today you call a Mini Cooper, but it was actually in Canada, it was a, an Austin Marina. And when a... A Dodge Monaco, I believe it was, a 1976, either Dodge Monaco or Impala, a big car, hit us, broadsided. It took him an hour and a half to, with the jaws of life to get us out of the car. I thought I had died because I, I shared this before, but I, I hit that, you know, where everybody sees the light at the end of the tunnel, and I was going to it. I can tell you, as it was happened, as if it happened yesterday, I was on that going to the light but I remembered screaming out and hearing my voice echo in this atmosphere I want to live and I ended up coming back into my body the widest part in that car was 11 inches all of us lived but my injuries in my back my neck but look mostly my lower back and internal bruising the doctor said You'll never play hockey again. And yet it was everything that, it's where I found my identity. As an athlete, I wasn't, I wasn't that great. I wasn't the best by, by far. I wasn't a superstar. 
but I, I loved every day. My brother Mike <clears throat> will tell you, my sister Mary, my, my, my brother Henry, like we, we would like get up every day looking to play road hockey as kids. Not in Israel, in Canada. And, uh, and so, you know, like this past Saturday, just yesterday, you know, my brother Mike, my son Mikey, my son Costi, who's about to come back and play with us. But like we live for Saturday morning. Get on that ice, fresh sheet, fresh sheet of ice, that, that smell of putting on the gear. And when, my, when the doctor said, you're done, my world seemed to have come apart back then as I sort of processed this whole identity. And I felt like everything was coming, it, literally everything was crashing down. It felt like I had died, but the problem was I'm still alive. Because everything that I dreamed of, everything that I ever wanted to become, I found my identity in a game that I love and still love. Not only did I have to live through that death, but now I'm trying to find new life on the other side of it. What, I'm, what am I going to do? And at the time, it seemed very unfair, way overwhelming, just impossible to deal with because I felt like I'd been robbed of my identity. And now I didn't know how to get it back. How can I step back on that, on that ice? How can I play the game that I love? How can I try to go as far as I can? And some people might, you might even be saying like, well, that's just a, you know, a silly young man's dream. But, but I don't think so because that, it did such damage to me at such a young age. And now I look back because, I, honestly, I look back over the years that I've counseled, whether young people, old people, and everyone in between, I realize that how many of us, our identity is wrapped up in something other than our creator. It's wrapped up in how much money we're going to bring in, how much money we're going to make. It's wrapped up in my position. It's wrapped up in my career. And so here's what happens. And because... The creation was never designed to carry the weight of defining us. At some point, our misplaced identity, those dreams will crumble. Because God never created you and I to carry the weight as creation, to carry the weight of who we are by what we do. Because our identity is actually in Him. Now, again, that sounds really, it's so much easier to say than live. You know, and we can talk about it, you know, who are, I, I know who I am in Christ. What does that actually mean? What does that actually mean? I mean, intangible, in relational, help me understand, what does that mean? And so, why are we discouraged? Why do people battle discouragement? Why do people battle depression? Why are we disappointed? Because at the most basic of levels, it's because we've tried to find, we've tried to find a replacement identity in a fallen world. That's why you will never find your identity in this world. I don't care how much money you accumulate. I don't care how much like notoriety, even in church, even in church. One of the things that I will address at some point very soon in this series is this transition because so many of us in ministry actually find our identity in the ministry. And that can be damaging. That can be a setback just like trying to find your identity in your career. So, and I'm going to, I want to, I want to sort of unpack that. I want you to go with me, please, if you will. We're in 2 Peter. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Because here's, here's what happens. When, when, we are, when we try to find this, this replacement or a replacement identity in a fallen world, what happens without knowing is that this replacement identity often is unseen and unfelt. As your heart shifts from one thing to another. 
So I'm going to deal with this concept of this identity crisis, but I want us to look at, and this is going to be our go-to verse this morning, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and, and, or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is, is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Let me go back right, just one more time. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they kept you from being, listen, they kept you from being ineffective or unfruitful. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. What does that mean? So Peter is exposing something. Peter is dealing with something, and it's this cause and effect in, in the heart of every believer. I want to say that again. This is the cause and effect in the heart of every believer. What does that mean? It means we become ineffective and we become, we become unfruitful in the life when we forget who we are and what we've been given in Christ. When we forget who we are and what we've been given in Christ, we become ineffective or unfruitful. Okay. How many believers in this world today know Jesus, gave their life to Jesus, but are ineffective and are unfruitful? And why is that? Just because we gave our hearts to Jesus, it doesn't mean we're going to be effective and fruitful. And so Peter is making something incredibly plain and yet incredibly powerful. So I would ask you today, how have you forgotten who you are and what you've been given in Christ? This is so important to and this is something that we need to remind ourselves every single day. How have you forgotten what is it that caused you to forget who you are and what God has given you in Christ. This is why it is so important to address these things. And to be real with one another. And we'll get into that in our conversation. So, here's the obvious question then. The follow-up question would be this. Where is your heart trying to find identity in this creation? Because wherever your heart is trying to find this identity... If it's connected to this creation, it's going to fail you. And that's why it is so important to identify those replacements in our lives. Where am I trying to find my true identity? That's why those verses in, in Peter are so important. And by the way, this is why a community of believers... Are so is so important to be a part of because and, and why it's absolutely necessary because your spiritual eyes can be blinded and so and when our and when our our spiritual eyes are blinded we end up with this identity amnesia and we forget who we are and if you don't have people around you reminding you of who you are in Christ, of who you truly are, that whatever you're going through does not define you. And whatever you've been through doesn't define you. That's not the label that God puts on us. So it is good to be a part of a church family or a community or a, a, a group of believers that remind you when you've been blindsided by a situation that this is not who you are. Yes, it's an event, and yes, it's a circumstance, but it doesn't define you. That should not label you. Because what actually identifies you is who you are in Christ. And you will see this when I come back to this. 
Because in, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, it says, but exhort one another daily. You know why it says exhort one another daily? It's because we need to be reminded daily because we all go through stuff daily. We're always reminded of what we're not. We're reminded of what we could have done better. But you, you need people around you that will tell you, yeah, you could have done that better, but I want to tell you something. There is something so good inside of you. And it's your relationship with Jesus. Look at what Jesus has done for you over the years. Let that be your reminder. Because a lot of times we have to admit. So let's go back. He says, this is Hebrews um, 3.13. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Where do, where do our hearts, why do our hearts get hardened? Because we've been deceived. We've been lied to. And so I, I have to humbly admit that sometimes I have memory loss. Can anybody admit that? And I don't mean natural memory loss. Sometimes I just, I totally forget because I'm struggling with some situation that is literally before my eyes that I actually forget who I am. I forget how close God is to me. I forget how active God is in my life. And so, and the beauty of it is God won't stop until the job's done. That's why you look at a Moses. God waited till he was 80 years old before he would use him. 40 years, he thought he was somebody. The next 40 years, he realized he was nobody. And then God said, okay, I'm ready to use you. Imagine waiting until you're 80 for God to say, hey, I'll use you. Now I'll use you. Now you've actually, now you, you've actually, you're ready. And so often, so we go through these things in life where we, we struggle with who we are. So in these coming weeks, I'm going to, I want to share what, what are the things where we tend to find, where are those things where we t tend to find our identity outside of our relationship with Jesus? For example, a lot of people will find their identity in their achievements. Others will find their identity in their relationships. Others are going to find their identity in religion or spirituality. Others are going to find their identity in, in a created world. And so if we pursue our identity in achievement or in religion, like I said, if we, if we are going to find our identity horizontally, we're going to fail. And we're going to have really difficult moments in life. Because your identity isn't found horizontally, your identity is found vertically. And we spend most of our life pursuing our identity horizontally. And that's why we looked at those verses in, in 2 Peter. But in these coming weeks, I want to address those things. I really want to like rip away those layers and say, can we just be honest and can we just be transparent about where have I been trying to find my identity? And that is a daily battle. A daily battle. But I want victory over it. Anybody with me? Amen. And so today I just want to examine three particular fruits that we that, that develop as a result of a lifestyle or a season of life that is shaped by misplaced identity. Number one, write this down please, delusion. We often buy the delusion that, I, that our identity is tangible and can be found in the physical world. I want to say this to you. Your identity will be never found in a tangible world that is broken and that is fallen. So, because here's what happens. I want you to think about, for, just, just think about it with me for a moment. Our meaning and our purpose in life is derived by faith. Right? Okay, by, by, by grace you've been saved through faith. Right. So, if meaning and purpose is derived by faith from a 
vertical relationship with an unseen God and not horizontally by what I feel or what I, I touch or what I experience it's so important to it is so important to understand that and to get that deep because I think a lot of us have lived a delusional life and I don't mean that as a as a bad thing in the sense of personal okay because I'm as delusional as anybody but again we 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 try we often buy into this delusion into this delusional identity because we think that it's tangible You know, when, when you hear stories of billionaires jumping off roofs to their death, it is so obvious that having billions and millions of dollars can't define you. Or you reach a certain level of success only to find yourself in rehab for years because having all that success and all that money turned your life into misery so I come back to our meaning and our purpose is then derived it's because it is it's derived by faith and it's derived from a vertical relationship with God and not the horizontal relationship with people and then we also then we buy this this delusion that that because if you believe that, and it's all about tangibility, I've got my house, I've got my car, I've got my money, I've got my stocks, I've got my bonds, I've got this, I've got that. And then we buy into this delusion that what we have is going to last. Because it isn't. Not one bit of it. Because your future... Successes in business isn't guaranteed. One turn of our economy, as we've seen, can shake the very foundation of our nation. I'll go one step further. Our church. Our church. I mean, have to be honest, or my ministry. My ministry, or your ministry, won't, we're not going to stick around forever. Reality. Your kids. Most all of our kids have grown up. They've become adults. They have children. They've moved out. Let's take it a little bit more personal. Your body. Man, there was a day in your 30s you could run and you can... And now? God, if you try to walk a mile, oh, ah, Right? Your skin was so tight and so beautiful, and now it's, it's, you're still beautiful, it's just not as tight. <laughs> but again, I, again I, I'm serious, like our bodies will, will shape, will, our shape, our, it's going to change, and there's going to be wrinkles, and we're going to weaken, and parts of our bodies are going to malfunction, because none of it lasts. So we bought into this delusion that this is going to last, it isn't. I've seen it way too many times and tragically when somebody thought their life was going to be lived for a long time. They got their feet taken out from under them. And then we, we, we mourn their loss. They died so young. Because when you seek identity from a horizontal or tangible experience, you're placing your hope in something that is going to wither and something that's going to fade. When I was young, I thought I was going to live forever. I, I mean, I used to say, man, those old people in their 60s. Oh, I regret because now I am that old person. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. So only God, only God outlasts time. 
That's why it is so important to honestly just like get real, very real with ourselves to say, who am I? And where am I, where am I finding my sense of identity? Am I finding it in tangible things? Am I finding it in reputation and money and possessions and success? Only God outlasts time. Only God avoids decay. Only God, only God eludes chaos. In other words, trusting anything or anyone, trusting anything or anyone else is a delusional danger because it's going to come, inevitably, it's going to crash. It's going to die. And so I don't want to wait till I'm 80 to have a relationship with God where I trust Him for my daily sustenance and that I'm not having to like struggle with who am I. So number one, delusion. Number two, disappointment. These are three things that we want to address. Disappointment. Because many of us don't have positive experiences with this actual physical world. Most people on the planet are disappointed because of something they experienced in this physical world. And so at times we feel like life is unfair. At times we think like, you know, why am I having to struggle with this? Let's be honest. I struggle sometimes. I do. When I know somebody's not living for the Lord and they've got a ton of success. And I'm like, God, have you missed something? Because here I am trying to live and I'm trying to do, the, and I'm doing and I'm doing and I'm living and I'm, I'm pursuing and I'm praying and I'm doing all, I think I'm doing all the right things. Yeah, I got flaws. I get it. But why is it that this person who's got a ton of flaws and doesn't give a rat's mm about anybody and they've got all of the things that we would all love to have. Okay. So there's times where I feel like life is unfair. And so we struggle to celebrate with others when they receive the blessing. Right? And then so we've then told ourselves again and again that our, our success, my growth... We're going to grow. It's all, it's just around the corner. And then we get prophetic words. It's just around the corner. And I'm not saying those are not prophetic words, but if it doesn't seem to come around, and I got a question. I struggle with that. My success is just around the corner. You're going to do this, and it's just around the corner. Can somebody get me around the corner? <laughs> Because I've been, in, I've been in this position waiting to go around this corner for like 30 years. Am I, are we right? Okay. So disappointment. Because we're waiting for something to happen and we end up feeling like we've been ripped off. And I understand why the enemy would go to Adam and Eve and say, well, you know, if God's so good, you know, he, he would have given you this wisdom. And then we begin to question God's goodness. Well, wait, if God loves me and if God is so good, why is he not letting me in on this? Why is he withholding this one tree? And so then we feel like we're ripped off. We're getting ripped off. We become resentful. We begin to question the goodness and the love and the wisdom of God. And why would he single me out? Why would he single us? You know, why would he single you out in this? Anybody know? Anybody struggle with this at times? No? Okay, good. But if you do... Read Psalms 73 and your struggle will come to an end because God has a way of dealing with people and dealing with things and dealing with us. So why would this person, why would that person who clearly doesn't deserve to be blessed, why would that person experience life and blessings? But again, here's the danger. We defined the good life. What does the good life mean? What is the good life to you, and what is the good life to somebody who doesn't know Jesus? Mm -hmm. 
So again, pers perspective. Because good life, this good life, right, is in, in this physical, horizontal terms, rather than the vertical and spiritual relationship with God, I, I, okay, do I want this good life? Or do I want this good life? You, I mean, if I can only have one or the other, I'd much rather have this good life. The third fruit we want to address is emptiness. So, delusion, disappointment, and emptiness. Whether we're delusional or disappointed, we will experience the emptiness that a misplaced identity never fails to produce. I'm going to say that again. Whenever we have a misplaced identity, we're going to struggle with delusion and disappointment and emptiness. Because this is why the Bible states, Jesus said, Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone. So Jesus teaches us that human beings are actually spiritual beings created to feed on the Lord himself. That's why he lost so many when he started talking about taking, eating the Lord's body, eating his flesh, right? And a whole bunch just went, that's way too weird. They didn't understand. So Jesus teaches us, okay, as spiritual beings, we actually were created by God to feed on him. To feed on the Lord. That he is our bread. He is our water. He is our, he's my meat. He's my drink. And that only he alone can satisfy the deep, the deep thirstings and the deep hunger of my life. So in other words, it's, it's, it's only in a vertical relationship with this eternal God that satisfaction of my heart can be found. I mean, again... You, you look at the wisdom and the, and the wealth of Solomon. And then you, you, you look at his life. Or you look at David's life. And I can just go on and on. And they, just, and they gain so many things. But at the end, even Solomon, the wisest man in, on the entire planet. And the richest man in the time, on the, if not ever, in the entire planet apart from Jesus. He said, in the end, it's all vanity. It's all vanity. So... I want to encourage you this week to take this in, take inventory of your identity. I mean, just to get really, really honest with you and get honest with God. And why are you seeking? Wh where are you seeking? Where are you seeking purpose? Where are you seeking meaning? Because God is always giving us an opportunity to take an account and to make honest confession. And I'm telling you, I've had to do that. The last 24 hours, I've had to get very serious. And to really look at my life and say, where, where am I trying to find my identity? What, where am I trying to find my purpose? Am I taking an honest account? Am I, am I doing this self-evaluation, not in psychology, but allowing the Holy Spirit to say, that is a weakness. And you're, and you're putting your identity horizontally in this when you should be putting your identity vertically in this. Because... Identity, when we talk about our identity in Christ, I'm going to wrap this up in a moment. Identity in Christ never leads to emptiness. So anytime you feel empty, it is because you're trying to find your identity horizontally. Because identity in Christ will never leave you empty. Never. It will actually leave you with, with a life full of abundance, and that doesn't mean you have to have a lot of things. All right, so let's come back to this for a moment. 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter 1 and 8. I want to bring this verse back to, into play because the issue is identity. Would you, would you agree with me that a lot of our issues in life come from and stem from our lack of identity or just identity? And so here's the principle. When I forget who I am in Christ, I quit pursuing 
that which belongs to me in Christ. I'm going to say that to you again. When I forget who I am in Christ, which has to be a daily reminder, I'm going to quit pursuing what belongs to me in Christ. So if I'm looking for identity horizontally, I am never going to pursue my identity or what I want or what I desire or what I need vertically. So, so 2 Peter, let's go back to this. 2 Peter 1 verses 8 and 9. He says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. Here's the verse. Here's this part. Having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Why is this so good? And this to me is just rich and it's important because Peter is saying that that there's this widespread identity crisis. There's this widespread identity amnesia in the body of Christ. And he's saying, we forget who we are. And when we forget who we are, we forget what we've been given. And what we've been given in Christ. And so we have this identity amnesia, which always leads to identity replacement. Whenever you struggle with identity amnesia, and you don't remember who you are in Christ, just again, take this verse and just let that be your verses this week. And just keep reading it over and over again. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. And then he says, in, in what? This is powerful. They'll keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for whoever lacks these, so if, if you struggle with being ineffective and you struggle with being unfruitful, here's your battle. You're going to be nearsighted and blind because we've forgotten that we've been actually cleansed from all of our former sins because of Jesus. So we allow, we allow all these things that, so he, Peter is saying, listen, there's this, there's, we have lost, in a sense, we've lost our minds. We've forgotten who we are. And because we've forgotten who we are, we stop pursuing that relationship. And now, rather than pursuing the relationship this way, I'm now pursuing relationships this way, trying to get my identity that was never meant to be this way. It was meant to come from... Is that making sense? So if I'm not getting my identity vertically, please write this down. If I'm not getting my identity vertically, then I'm going to get it horizontally. And I don't care how long you live, and I don't care how perfect your life is. You will never attain your true identity if all you're doing is pursuing it horizontally. God never intended for you or I to get our identity from horizontal relationships or a horizontal kind of life. In other words, I'm going to turn my job, I'm going to turn to my job as a means of identity. And this is hard for us. This is hard for you and me. Ferris, because some of us struggle with our identity being in ministry. And I understand that. I do understand that. I understand the principle of calling and the callings of God are irrevocable. We all sort of we understand that. But it's it this is this is going to become a problem. Because if, if, if people are going to turn to their jobs as a means of identity, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to turn to my ministry as a form of identity. Ministry is just what I do. Yes, it is connected to my calling and it is a part of my identity, but it's not my whole identity. Because there's going to come a day when I won't be doing this like this. So I better have a greater sense of identity outside of Sunday mornings. 
Why do you, I mean, it's just tragic. Pastors end up committing suicide. Why? How tragic. Because they struggle, maybe, or they, with that identity. And if they're not doing ministry or if they're not have if they're not on a stage or a platform, and, and let me just break it down even more. Because okay, in the same way, like I may turn to and, and have turned to getting my identity from ministry, where somebody else will get their identity from their job. Others will get their, you know, uh, am I gonna turn to, to, to you know, am I gonna get my identity from being a parent? Am I gonna get my identity from being a husband? Or am I you're gonna get your identity from being a wife? Or am I gonna turn to my possessions as a meaning of my identity? Am I going to turn to my relationships into a meaning of identity? And so we, these are all of these identity replacements. And here's what, here's, 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 here's what happens. The problem is those things were never meant to give me my identity. And so when I look for them as my basic sense of identity, my meaning and my purpose is going to fail. Because you can turn your relationships, listen, you can turn your relationships, your personal relationships, into personal messiahs. You can turn your job into your own personal messiah. You can turn your children into your own personal messiah. You can turn to your parenting as your own personal messiah. You can, so you can turn your possessions into your own personal messiah. So we've got all these things that we've made gods. And then we struggle with our identity because if those things aren't successful, the failure is on me. So those things are, by the way, those things are experiences. Those things are gifts from God. But never, never were they meant to be my identity in God. And so when they become my identity, listen, they will always leave me empty. And we experience that as parents. Your kids grow up, all that time you invested in them. And then they grow up and they become adults and now they're, they've moved out. <coughs> They live, they live on their own. They've got their own lives now. They're, own, they're busy. Is that making sense? Okay. So it's, it's, it's good to confess. It actually is good to confess. And we need to confess that sometimes we do forget who we are in Christ. And we need to confess that sometimes I am ineffective. I am unfruitful. And I think we need to confess that sometimes we seek our identity horizontally rather than vertically. But the beauty of all that is, no matter how discouraged you may be at times, the beauty of that is every morning God gives us new mercies. Every day God gives us an opportunity to touch him and for him to touch us. There's so much more, but I, I'm going to stop. Remember what I said earlier. New identity, new potential. Because you're always assigning yourself some kind of an identity. Every day, every day, you are assigning yourself. I struggled with this yesterday. I struggled with this in a major way yesterday. I struggled with this in a major way yesterday. And that is, again, you're always assigning yourself some kind of identity and you're always going to live out that identity. So you better know who you are because that's how you're going to live your life. You're going to live your life out of that identity. And so I come back to this verse. 2 Peter 2 verses 4 and 5. And I love this. We already read it, but I know some of you guys came in after this. He says, as you come to him, this is 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen, precious. You yourselves are 
are like living stones that are being built up as a spiritual house to be, listen, to be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to, acceptable to God through Christ Jesus or through Jesus Christ. So does that describe you? Does that describe me? Because there's a two-word picture here that Peter is trying to help us understand. If you want to know who you are, read those verses over and over and over again. Because the first thing he says, and again, I'm asking an honest question of all of us. Where are you getting your identity from? Because if you're trying to get your identity from what is horizontal, it's going to end up biting you. And it's going to end up hurting you. But if you, if you aim to get your identity, identity from a vertical relationship of, of who you are in Christ. So who am I in Christ? A very sophisticated, deep question. But again, I want to stick to I want to stick to scripture. And yes, we can go, we can read through, and yes, well, there's so many different things that I am in Christ, and we can read through those scriptures, and they're all true. But as you come to him, this is so important. We're waiting for him to come to us, and he did come to us. But now this is not about just him coming to us. This is about us pursuing the one every single day who pursues us. So he says, as you come to him. A living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, who am I? Yes, okay, I get it, I get it, I love it. I'm chosen, I'm precious. And then he says, you yourselves are like living stones being built up in as a spiritual house. So who am I? And who are you? And then he says, a spiritual house to be, holy, uh, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ or through Jesus Christ. So in other words, again, I ask, does that describe you? What does that mean? First, the first one is this. You and I are a temple. Listen to me. And I mean this with the sincerest of heart in every way. You and I are God's holy temple. That's who you are. You are the temple of God. You are the house of God. So first, I'm a temple. And second, he says, you're a priesthood. This is so important for us to truly grasp so that we do. I'm talking, I love you, Robbie. God, I love you. So who's Robbie? Robbie is first. Shut up. Robbie is first. As Robbie, as Robbie finds his, his identity in his vertical relationship. So who is Robbie? Robbie, sorry, uh, okay, I'll use another name. Bobby. <laughs> sorry, Bob, you're here too. Sorry, man, I've run out of names. Okay, so who, who, who is Robbie? Robbie is first. Because if, depending on who you ask that is around Robbie, they're going to give you his different identity. They're going to all say something different about him. My question to Robbie is, who are you Apart from all those voices. Robbie's a grandpa. Yes, he is. That's not his full identity. Right? Robbie's a great friend. I love him with all my heart. I'll kill for him. But he's more than that. So again, I come back to who is Robbie? First, Robbie is a temple. And then secondly, Robbie is a priest. Robbie is, has, there's a priesthood with him. That means... You're God's temple. Would you say that with me? I am God's temple. I'm telling you, we need to like we need to get back to this simple basic stuff. Who am I? I am God's temple. And who am I? I am I am I'm a I'm a priest in the house of God, male and female. I there's a priesthood. So you're God's temple because you're being built up together as a place where God in his glory dwells. That's who you are. Because the body of Christ is a fulfillment of the temple of Solomon. I'm going to say that to you again. The body of Christ is the fulfillment of the temple of Solomon. The body of Christ is a fulfillment of the Old Testament priesthood. So to me, that's pretty amazing. Because you and I then have no greater honor in this life than this. 
And I don't care what you've accomplished. I say it with all of the respect, all respect in the world. I don't care what you've accomplished. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how big your house is. I don't care how much power you have. I don't, because here's the thing. Then, are you a temple that with all those achievements, with all those things, no matter how much money or how much power or how much success, then, but here's who you are now. Here's who you are now. That may have been you, but here's you, who you are now because of Jesus. You're now a stone in the temple of the Most High God, and you are now His priesthood. That's who you are. And if you don't see your life that way, you're going to struggle and that's why I think so many of us are people pleasers. We don't know who we are. We've lost our identity in Christ. And now we're trying to get our identity in horizontal relationships. And you're not going to make everybody happy all the time. And that I've struggled with that my entire life, by the way. I have struggled with that my entire life. I hate, and I mean hate, and I, it's a strong word. I hate disappointing people. And when I do, I will go through a very down moment of shame and rejection and stupid stuff because I put so much weight on trying to make everybody happy and the truth is, if I, if I don't disappoint them, somebody's going to. But I can't live my life in that, like walking on eggshells. And I have. And I'm tired of it. Just being honest. So I better, I better know who I am in Christ. And that is I am a temple. I'm a part of the temple of God. I'm, we are those stones because this life I'm telling you as great as it is at times and as horrible as it is at times the beauty of this life is it is but a dress rehearsal for what is eternal Amen, Amen. So Father I thank you I thank you for the finished work of the cross Lord, I ask you to open our eyes. And in opening our eyes, would you heal our hearts? We've tried to find our identity in so many things. And somehow, all those things became more important than you. And we would never admit it publicly. But Lord, we've struggled with how low we've placed you on that totem pole of life. We say we trust you, but do we really? Father, I ask you to open our eyes to the simplicity of just who we are and who we are in your word, because your word doesn't return void. You said heaven and earth will pass away before one dot or tittle is removed. One comma, one period. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than from something that you've said to be changed or edited or altered so, Father, I ask you to bring us to this, this true meaning of our identity. It's mind-boggling to me. God, it's so mind-boggling to me that we don't have to chase this, the things in this life, bumping into one thing, into the next thing. hoping to make it, 
But Lord, I can declare, God, I can say that we've been chosen. And I've been chosen by you to be a part of an eternal building, an eternal temple. And that, Lord, you've chosen, you've chosen us. And because you've chosen us, now we have access to you. Priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices, spiritual offerings. We are priests and kings, you said, unto our God. So, Father, I ask you to forgive us. I ask you to forgive me for where I've tried to find Sam Hinn. And for any time that I tried to find him in anything or anyone outside of you, I repent. I repent of my failure. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. For every person in this room and who may be watching who's struggling with their identity. And I ask you, God, that you would begin to tear down the idols that we've built up. God, dismantle the, the, this, this disillusion. Dismantle our disillusions. Dismantle our disappointments. Dismantle our emptiness. Let us find. Let us find who we are in you. Everyone's looking for who they are. Everyone is looking for their true identity. Sadly, some will never find them. They will never find who they truly are because they've rejected you. And so, Lord, today we offer our lives to you afresh in you. I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for the weight that I've placed upon others. Forgive me for the times that I've leaned more on others than I did on you. But you're teaching me. You're teaching me to find myself in you. Lord, we humbly come today and we confess our faults and our failures and ask you to have your way in us, that we will forever be reminded that we are a spiritual temple being built, living stones brought together as the temple of God, and that we are priesthood. Every day we offer the sacrifices, not of formal religion, but spiritual sacrifices of parenting, spiritual sacrifices of friendship, spiritual sacrifices in our workplace, in our neighborhood. Lord, today I surrender my will to yours. In every area of my life, Father, I thank you. I thank you. We thank you. Thank you for who you're making us. Thank you for what we are becoming in you. Forgive us for being ineffective. Forgive us for our times where we were unfruitful. Forgive us for the times we've leaned on the arm of flesh rather than our faith.
dismantle those replacements of our identity. In the name of Jesus, touch your people, Lord. Touch your people today with an abundance of grace. As John said, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for praying. Thank you for, for what you do to build God's kingdom. Don't ever stop. Because one day it will all come to an end. And the only thing that really truly remains is what we've sown into God's kingdom. I promise you. And you'll never outgive God. Never. And I pray that you'll find your true identity in Him every day. Every day. Lay your life before Him and ask Him, reveal. Reveal who I am in you. And just watch what He'll do. Because He will. God bless you. Church, I love you.